Good. Ready? Ready. All right. Thanks to everyone for coming out for my presentation. Um, I'm going to show you how I built an R2-D2 in 11 months. Um, I should start off first, like, why I built an R2-D2. And it has to do with um, me. Used to, I used to be an art teacher. I taught art for 10 years. And I did a lot of painting and drawing and working with sculpture and clay. And then I took the position of STEM instructor here, and I've been doing like a lot of small projects, like learning how electronics work, um, building a lot with Legos, you know, learning about gears and pulleys, um, Raspberry Pi, Microbit, and the, and the list goes on and on and on. But they were all really tiny projects, and um, it was for me to learn and then to share with the kids, and, and it was just fun to do too. And um, and then I came across the, the the possibility of building an R2D2. And what it was is I was going to go visit one of my best friends down in Kansas City, and the Maker Fair was happening there. I've never been to the, the big Maker Fair. And uh, I saw on their webpage that they had a Droid Builders Club with a bunch of people in a, um, I don't know, in, in a grouping with all their robots. And I'm like, that's my next project. It's, it's big. If there's a club, if I'm stuck, I can go visit the club, and they can, you know, like, that's my plan. Um, and the funny thing was, like, I went down to the Maker Faire and I talked to the club people and, and saw their droids. And I said, so do you meet often to build? And they're like, no, <laughs> we don't meet. Um, but we, if you contact us, we can help you. So that, I've had to rely mostly on, on building it. Um, up until the electronics part, I did most of this build by myself. And when I started, I didn't know anything. Um, and I started 11 months ago. Um, and when I say I didn't know anything, I didn't even know how to change the attachments on a Dremel. Um, so part of this project was to build something big, ambitious, share it with my kids. Yeah, there is name recognition. I'm the guy that built an R2 now. Um, but then it's been really empowering. Um, I've, I've learned different processes, techniques, a bunch of different tools. And, um, and it's fun to share. And, and so here's my presentation. Um, the contents of the presentation, um, I'm going to show you show you um, with pictures and videos and talk to you um, about R2-D2 facts, get, get to know the droid a little bit, um, and then give you some options if you want to build an R2 or other droid. And I'm, I'm basically condensing it to the Star Wars universe and basically astromechs, like no tall C-3PO's or protocol dro droids. And the reason I did that is because those, that's a suit played with, by an actor, and, and I really don't want to build a, tall, a robot that tall that could fall over and break. It doesn't have a low center of gravity. Um, I'm going to go through the R series droids, and you'll learn what those are soon. Um, color options, if you do an astromech, like where I go to get ideas, um, where, I, where I started to go to get ideas for colors, um, and then eventually just went with R2, but there's other colors out there. Um, optional upgrades, like all the accessories that you can build for it, um, and then several material options for the build, and then um, kind of my Instagram story some pictures and videos of the process I, I took to, to build my R2-D2. So here we go. We'll start with um, kind of bef what inspired R2-D2. Um, so I found that George Lucas got um, some of the idea to build R2-D2 from a 1972 movie called Silent Running. And this is a very short clip of a robot in that movie. And you can see some similarities. It's small, short, like R2. Uh, and it has many of the same attachments that R2 has, like the robot arm. I think they even said it had a buzz saw too. So mechanically, I'm like, how how did they do that? That's been it's been freaking me out. How did the legs move around all smoothly and organically? Well, it's it's an adult. They've hired actors and actresses that don't have legs. And so that robot, they're wearing the costume and they're walking on their hands. I'm like, wow. Um, I would have never guessed that, how they pulled that off. I thought it was all mechanical. And so that just shows you, I mean, this is we're talking about movies, and R2 is a movie prop. So um, yeah, that's something that kind of wowed me. But that's one of the, um, um, where R2-D2 got the name. Um, George Lucas was working on the script for Star Wars while he was working on um, making American Graffiti. And um, 
I guess what the story is, he woke up from a nap and one of the sound designers yelled out, um, they needed real two dialogue track two and the abbreviation for that is R2-D2. And he liked the sound of that. And he's like, okay, that'll be one of the robot's names. Um, the comedic duo of C-3PO and R2-D2 um, was these two characters from this Japanese movie called The Hidden Fortress that came out in 1958. I'm not gonna try to pronounce their names, but um, these were two you know, comical sidekicks that followed around the, the big hero in the movie. And then this is, um, this is just an interesting fact. Um, one of the artists that um, illustrated the prototype for R2-D2, um, one of the original thoughts is we're going to have R2-D2 walk around on three feet. And it's, it can barely see it, but in this photo, there's footprints in the sand, um, not track marks. Um, this is the artist that did it, Ralph McQuarey, I believe is how you pronounce it. And that's one of his early sketches of R2 before R2 was actually built. Um, interesting thing about this sketch um, is that the arm that sticks out to the side, and, and it's kind of more of a, a lower R2-D2, um, condensed R2-D2. This is like the basis, almost for the basis for building Chopper, which is another um, astromech that you'll see later. Um, it's a more recent droid. Um, here's Tony Dyson, one of the, the builders, probably one of the primary people that built R2-D2. The, the first prototypes and um, the first droids used in the film. Um, and this is Burn, Ben Burnt. Um, and this is just a quote from him. This is the person that made the sound for R2. Uh, we ended up with a 50-50 mix of electronic synthesizer, generated sound, and my voice making funny inflections. The combination camouflaged the two sources and we found that we could get R2 to act, but it was something that we arrived at very slowly. Oh, just to give you a heads up, I'm, I'm, I like, for dummies books when I was younger, like learn something really fast. So I like the part of tens. So I kind of find like 10 facts and 10 this. So that's the kind of the rhythm we're going with this presentation. Um, R2-D2, they had different models in um, A New Hope, the first movie that came out in 1977. Um, they had a radio controlled model that broke down a lot. Um, they had one where they just pulled on a string because it was broke down. They actually made it, later on they made castings of ones that, that so they were lighter to pull. And, um, and then they had ones where they had an actor inside it and that actor was Kenny Baker, born in 1934 and passed away in 2016. Um, the main difference between the radio controlled models, well obviously it's hollowed out, but um, there's another thing, um, there's big tubes that you can see in some shots where the actor's legs came down near the battery boxes and they looked like, um, like those, um, big duck vents. Um, and then this is the current um, actor, Jimmy V, that plays R2-D2 sometimes. Mostly nowadays, it's, it's, well, it's a lot of CG. But um, Jimmy V um, has done some Doctor Who characters. Um, it's a British sci-fi show. If you're watching this, you know what I'm talking about, I'm pretty sure, if you're a big Star Wars fan. Um, going on, oh, this is the science fi fiction uh, company that produces these androids, it's industrial automation. So a little pretend company that builds them. And this is the, the number that I found when doing research on um, R2. $2.75 million was spent on an R2 unit um, that was used in um, several of the first films, first three films, and it and went on auction. The, the crazy thing about that is um, it had no internal like workings. It didn't roll around, it, you know, it didn't beep or chirp. So um, mine can do all that, but anyway. Um, so now we're going on this section where I give you just a, a huge selection of droids to pick from that are mostly astromech, low sitting droids. These are droids from Solo, A Star Wars Story, really colorful droids. Um, this is a MS, MSE6 mouse droid, and um, you can build one. There's, um, there's a, a club of mouse droid builders out there. And um, all it is is an R remote control car. And um, they do plug in a, an MP3 trigger so you can trigger the sounds of the robot too. And they have people that 3D print the shells or vacuum form the shells. And you can 3D print all the parts, the details on that. This is my next, I wanna build this one next. Partly it's because it's affordable. And, and I need to take a break from expensive robots. This, this is kinda like it's new school version. You'll see this in Solo, 
in that sh in the street chase at the beginning, and you'll see this, in, and I'll, I'll show a clip on this, but this is the first order sentry droid. You'll see it in the movies, the one on the left. The one on the right is in, in the animation series, and in, in the animation series, it pops out of its shell and it goes into attack mode. It never does that in the movie, and you can tell the dome's different too. It's got a round dome. I do have a short video to show you that in action, the sentry droid. This is um, the Disney Star Wars Resistance animation that has come out recently. Oh, I am out of order. That's the next droid coming up. Nope, I have the wrong video, but that's okay. Um, this is a gonk droid. Technically, it's called the GNK power droid. I think that's funny because I, I didn't know any of this stuff 11 months ago. Um, so they just have a smaller actor in there wearing it as a suit. Um, you can build one of these. Um, all you need is Rubbermaid storage containers, two of them. If you look at the picture and flip them upside down, that's what people do to, to make this. This is a, probably one of the cheapest builds. You don't, you don't need electronics. You don't need expensive equipment. Um, this, this one's famous from a Star Wars video game, the T3 M4. People actually make these, and that's why I'm showing you this. Like, this is pretty cool. Even... So that's that one. Um, the BB series. There's BB4, two BB2, BB9E, and BB8. And um, there's droid builders that build these too. And um, some of them just do stationary ones where they don't roll around because it's, they take them to very public areas and then the heads fall off of them, the magnetic heads. So it's just safer to, to keep their investment sitting in one place. And then they do have the head, you know, twitch around on the dome. Um, this is Chopper. Chopper um, is a famous droid. I had no idea it was so famous until I started doing this research. Um, whoops. Um, Star Wars Rebels, it's a Disney animation show. And a C-110P. This is the one that I was talking about in the earlier sketch. Um, it looks like that first from drawing of ideas for, for R2-D2. And there's people that make this one um, R1J5 is, um, no, I've never seen anybody make this yet, but I've seen on the Droid Builder Facebook Club and Instagram that there's people out there that are starting to make this one. And basically, you take the skirt off, there's no skirt, there's no skin, it's missing the dome shell. Um, it's pretty, pretty interesting to watch. It looks like a hunk of junk, but the animators do a great job of bringing it to life, so I thought I'd play a real short 60-second clip on this, in this robot. No bucket, I haven't seen your helmet. Look around. You gotta be here somewhere. You feel naked without it? Technically, you're always naked, bucket. Then retrace your steps. Maybe you can figure out where you left it. Okay, so this is um, from Solo, um, L337. And um, I had no idea that this was an R2-D2 unit, or an R2 unit. Um, and you can see, once you find that, you're like, oh yeah, there's the same parts on, on both robots. The story is that the L337 um, just customized herself. She rebuilt herself and gave herself you know, a more appealing form. 
And you can even see like her whole shoulder is the whole shoulder of an R2 unit. Um, this one I put in there just because it interests me. It was on the Star Wars Resistance animation show. And um, it has three eyes. And I thought that's a pretty cool looking droid. I mean, um, and then this one, um, it's in the comic books, BT1. And um, someone made this. And I guess it's like an evil astromech. And uh, whoops. I need to learn how to jump out of my slideshow Prezi. And I'll show you a video of this one. Um, I don't know how they did the eye on this. It is, it is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And um, it has a it has a protocol droid, a really tall like C three P C three P O looking droid that's black with red eyes too, and I think their game is murder. They're just an evil robot. But um, that one didn't have the the guns all over it. And I thought, wow, that's whoever. However, they figured the eye on that. It's pretty amazing. Um, whoops. I'm just gonna take a moment to fix my presentation, my Zoom, or try to. There we go. OK, so I put this in here. This was um, a toy company selling Star Wars droids. And I thought this is a pretty great um, size comparison of some of the many famous droids. I've seen someone build the K2SO, but it sits, it's basically on a pedestal on, with wheels. And they have you know, an arm that holds it up. It, it basically looks like a giant puppet. It doesn't stand on its own. And then these, this, um, these came out just last week. This is a photo from um, Disney's new Galaxy Edge. It's their theme park that they're opening soon. And what's going on here is that you can buy these droids in this droid depot. You can assemble your droid with the components that you want. And then you take it around the theme park, and it interacts with theme park stuff. I don't know the scale of these. They haven't released that yet. Um, but there's, there's some um, other droids in here. There's an RO series, which I don't really know anything about, but I see it around a lot in different places. And then DJ Rex has been a theme park um, Disney Star Wars droid before. So I'm going to go through the R series droids just really quick. I'll speed this up. There's an R1. You'll see it in A New Hope. It just has like one foot. This is an R, another R2 unit other than R2-D2. Um, I should tell you that their job is maintenance. Basically, you'll see them save everybody's lives in the movies because they're fixing things all the time. That's one of their number one jobs. Um, they also help um, store coordinates for jumping into hyperspace, I believe, you know, figuring out how to not hit another planet when they're jumping really fast. This one is um, R2-KT, and there's also another pink one that looks different than this. It's an R2-QT. Um, R3 units have clear domes. And then um, there's people that make every single R series. This one is taken from on set of the live action series that Disney's producing right now, um, The Mandalorian. Um, so when they come out with Disney Plus, you can watch um, kind of like the, the assassin that Boba Fett is. It'll be some character like that. And this is an R5 unit from the first movie that came out in 1977, but they're using one in a new production. So kind of a, a, a Holler back, R7, R8, and R9. And you won't see these last few in movies. You'll see them in comic books. Um, color scheme, um, if you want to build an astromech, let's say you want to choose and build an astromech like R2. Um, tons of colors out there. One place I found on my own is Hasbro. They have a toy catalog. And they have like every color, it, it appears, out there. And so these are all the droids from the Phantom Menace and all their different color schemes and even their name. Like the blue and yellow one is R2-B1. And I'm just going to zip through here and just show you. Like a great resource if you want to know names of droids and color is Hasbro Toys. They have Force Awakens. And then there's some BB series. Um, it's a little overwhelming. One of my favorites is the candy corn one. It's a Halloween. One painted like a piece of candy corn. And there's even solo droids in there. 
Um, moving on. You. So, um, and then just one picture of uh, Joy Builder from Facebook. Um, I did not do this weathering technique. I asked him how he did it, and he said mustard was part of the process of masking. And I don't know to believe him, or he's just pulling my leg, but I like how the paint chips off, and I've seen a couple R2 units like that. That's something I want to learn to do. Um, and then here's some optional, I chose 10 optional upgrades. Everything you see in the movies, people in um, the Joy Building Club have figured out how to do, except to make R2 fly. But they have figured out how to um, have rocket boosters come out of the legs. So here's some videos. This is, um, this is called 232. Two legs standing that transition to three and then back to two. Rawr. I did not do the semi droid. I was kind of going for speed. I think you got that one. Um, moving on. Um, zapper. They even put a servo on the door on some of them to make doors go open and close. <laughs> No, I don't think I'm going to do Zapper. Um, fire extinguisher. You can see a chopper, the orange one in the background, someone built. Um, hollow projector. One of these videos, um, you'll see Princess Leia being projected onto a wall. I've seen another video where someone had the Death Star plans projected. So I don't know how they is isolated her video, but hats off to the person that figured out how to isolate the video. You can, you can buy small projectors. That's not the, the challenge, I don't think, in that one. And then this is something I want to do to mine. You can put um, servos, attach them to the hollow projectors. Those are those, it looks red in that one, but those hollow projectors are twitching, the ones that stick out. And you do see um, R2 twitch the front one primarily in the movie from time to time. Oh, and there's, there's names. You learn the names for every single part of the robot if you get into this. It gets pretty interesting. Gripper arm. My fear is I show you all these videos and then you see my robot that spins, chirps, and, and, and you're like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and um, everyone's got it figured out so the arms always come back in, the doors close. Anyway, a uh, life form scanner. I missed the pop up, didn't I? And I'm, I'm just going to assume the door closes because they're, they're awesome at figuring that stuff out. Um, this one has the periscope, but it also has all the domes, um, dome panels, and, and there, there's also pie panels. The ones that are pie panels are the ones that are near the top, the bigger ones. They has, um, has them all flipping up. And some of them have them synchronized, some joy builders, to music. So this is like a two for one. It shows you two tricks. Wow. 
the way in the arm. Yeah, that's not my um, low but my middle range budget R2 at all. I'm gonna. That's probably all aluminum. All the parts on that. There's probably not a single 3D printed part on that. Yeah. Yeah. There's looks. You know, the, the new ones look like toys though. If you keep them, I mean, though, if you keep them clean looking. I thought this rocket booster is over the top. And, and there's people out there sharing their files and how to do that. You can't see it in the, the online video, but yeah, <laughs> part of the leg descends into the heel and then a rocket pops out and tilts. This is why some people, they say um, it takes roughly six months to three years to build a droid. And some people do more than three years and you can see why. Um, all the stuff they put into it. Um, whoops. Um, this is probably the easiest one to do. You can 3D print a restraining bolt. With the restraining bolt and he will now put it on R2. Okay, put it on. And, Good job. And they put a piece of metal inside of R2's skin because I find out that it won't stick on aluminum if you put a magnet on the end. You know, dumb me, but um, I'm like, this is a metal robot. It'll just stick right on. So the restraining bolt's job is to basically control the robot, its owner, it, making it its, its slave. Um, and then this is one of the cool ones, and this one's hard to find. I've only seen like one video, one or two videos of it online. Um, ejects a lightsaber from the dome. Just like uh, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> All right. So material options. I don't have any more. It's going to slow down and there's not very many more, or it's going to speed up. There's not very many videos now. Um, you can build your entire droid out of aluminum. You can do a mix of materials, um, wood, resin, fiberglass. Um, styrene, it's little sh thin sheets of plastic. You get out um, a ruler and an X-Acto knife and you're basically cutting all the parts. And there's templates um, on astromech.net for all the blueprints on how to do this. There's no, like, there is one, it appears to be a manual. You can buy one for 120 bucks or you can just download the file, other files for free elsewhere that I think does a step-by-step, -step. Um, but not on everything, not electronics, not motors. Um, I got my files from the astromech.net, and um, there's a, a great builder named Michael, I think his name is Baddeley. I hear a lot of people get files from him. He's got some great files um, for 3D printing. If you just want to have an entirely 3D printed drone, um, beware though, um, a, lot, a lot of people don't do this in California, or they don't take it outside and drive it in a car, but PLA prints will warp. I mean, big, leave them in the car and they'll bend. And I'll show you one that I took down to Kansas City, left in the car, and then come home and figured out I had one in there, and it, it warped an entire piece, and I had to put it in the oven. I'll tell you that story later. Um, domes, this is probably the only price breakdown I do in here, because I can't take your entire night explaining everything I've seen. But you can buy a Lunum dome from a club member that's been approved by the, the council for quality. There is a council for, for quality, you know, dimensions and whatnot. And it's Granite Earth is the company that does it. And it's a $490 plus shipping aluminum dome. There's a fiberglass dome for $325. Um, this is probably where you're going to start is figuring out your dome. Styrene laser cut, $175. I pick that and I'll tell you why that makes sense in a moment. There's an uncut dome out of styrene. For 105, but the reason I chose not uncut is because the laser cuts out all the panels for you, and I didn't want to take a pencil. How do you? It's hard to trace rectangles on a round object and make everything pretty. And so, 175 bucks, fantastic in my in my head. You can get a clear dome for 98 plus shipping for an R3 series unit. You can get um if you wanted to 3D print it, 
I didn't put the costs up there because it depends on your material um, and where you buy it from. But you need, if you want to print it in one piece, and some people do, you need 18 inches wide. And you need 11, about 12 inches tall if you want to 3D print one out in one piece. And, and there's a lot of people that do that, and it prints for several days. I don't know how many days it prints. It's a big print. Um, I, other options, when I first started this, some people said you can do a convex security mirror. You know those mirrors that you see like a hospital hallway? And um, that's just a crazy looking dome with reflection. You're looking at yourself, you know, all the time. And then if you want to go really cheap, a squirrel, I think it's called baffle. Um, they put them on bird feeders and it's just a dome so the squirrel can't like, it slides off. <laughs> and I found one for 24 bucks, but it's only 15 inches in diameter. If you want to totally geek out on this, like, and, and be um, OCD, the, the width you're working with is about 18 inches. Um, so you got to adjust everything on that one. Um, that's where you can start. Oh, here's some other choices. Uh, I don't know exactly what's on here, but yeah, it's bedazzled. I, th I threw in some fun stuff to see some, some creative things people have done. Um, not everyone does stock R2s. Oh, no. Load, buddy. It's not even done, but it looks pretty. Yeah, they're right. <laughs> Um, someone made a Kinex droid that moves around out of Kinex. That would be a cheaper route. <laughs> it does move. You have to you have to watch. It's moving like a couple inches. Um, I did see a Lego one down in Kansas City at the Maker Fair. I'm not sure if this is the same one. This this is a, an expensive build. Lego's not cheap. They've had people made R2 units that look like a Lego Star Wars piece, but life size. Not to jump forward, it does drive around. That's actually, oh, that's a mouse droid right there. That's, that's what a mouse droid sounds like. I don't know, I think so, whoops. Um, steampunk, there's, there's a few steampunk variations and each, each have something amazing on them that I've seen. The inside gears in the dome are cool on this one. Um, R2 Deco. <laughs> that, that's a beautiful, expensive build there. And then um, my R2 um, that I started 11 months ago. And I'll, I'll zip through here. Okay. So I started in um, April and started 3D printing parts. Um, the plastic pieces are probably some, I 3D printed these pieces, but the clear pieces you see in each picture, I had to order. This is a, a solid acrylic that you put inside the hollow projectors. I got those off of Amazon. Same with the acrylic globe. That's actually, the, it's right on the, my computer. That's half a shell of a Christmas ornament. And that's the big radar eye. So I think, you know, like this, this was pretty cheap and it's pretty durable because it's thick plastic. Um, so those are some fun arts and crafts things I bought. I could not find these at Hobby Lobby. I tried to source everything locally that I could 
and most times it did not work out. Um, but Menards was pretty good for me for like basic stuff like hardware. Um, these are called TESAs, and I didn't want to solder all these LEDs and all these circuit boards or code it and find all the pieces. So there's a guy in the club, hey, I'll put this whole kit together for you, and it comes and it looks like that and all the separate pieces. And then the video shows mine after I wired it all up before I stuck it inside the dome. So these are all the lights that you see on the dome. Um, and you know the code is already put on the Arduino that runs the flickering and, and chooses the color for everything. And that was a pretty, it looks really complex, but I could just, it was just a plug and play. I didn't have to solder anything. So this, is, this was an investment, investment that cost me like over 200 bucks. Um, but if I were to do it on my own, it would have taken me eons to figure out how to code it. You know, like somebody designed these printed, these circuit boards. I don't think these are stock circuit boards. You know, the, these people in these clubs, some of these people work for NASA. Um, and they, 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 don't, they know how to do stuff. Or um, it's pretty incredible stuff. So that's what all my electronics look like out of the dome. Um, and okay, so this is some of the stuff. Whoa, ah, I got to edit something there. Um, so this is another kit I bought that someone made of these acrylic pieces of, of plastic on the left side. Those are logic bezels. Um, the bezels are the ones where the LEDs actually slide in there. And so you can't see the printed circuit board when you look at the robot when you get close. That's just like a black shield to hide the components inside. And then there's a clear shield on top so kids don't poke my LEDs with their finger. That's what I think it's for. And these are, <laughs> these are um, diffusers, and it just diffuses the light. So you don't see that there's a printed circuit board behind my PSIs. And those are, um, oh, I know the word, um, process state indicators. That's the big one on the front that's blinking or shifting between red and blue. And then there's another one on the back that shifts two other colors. And that's, there's two different sizes. The one in the front, I think, is smaller. Um, and then there's, I needed diffusers for my hollow projectors, this right here, because if you look inside, you can see, oh, he stuck an LED in there. Well, you cut out, um, and this was supposed to be really cool. Oh, flashing, the scissors. I cut out three circles for each one of my hollow projectors out of a milk jug, the white plastic. Um, and then here's my dome styrene laser cut. And um, what you get when you buy that $175 dome is you get an inner dome at the top, which is just as an, a dome with nothing cut in it. And then you get an outer dome that's been laser cut. Um, all these panels haven't been broken off. Some of them fell off in shipping. And then you get this piece up here, which is just a ring right down here. And the weird thing is, I don't know why they, they have all this plastic. You have to cut off this whole center and make it into a donut. Um, so that's what you get. And this is fun to clean up with um, a Dremel. And even I bought little hobby files to clean up all the burrs from busting all these pieces off. And then you have to, these are the outer dome panels with all the panels removed. This is pretty flimsy right here because it's just thin styrene plastic. Um, I drilled holes in the dome. Actually, the inner dome, remember I said it was a solid piece? I had to mark and cut out some of the holes for the lights to come through. So I had to like work this thing. It wasn't just to throw it together. And then when you glue this whole thing together, it's really touchy. If you do a, a, a terrible job at it, you know, things won't line up. So they said that you put holes in it so air can move out. And also you can inject glue through the holes. When you put this, flip it over and put it on top of this one. And that's what creates depth is I got an inner dome and these are the outer dome panels um, on the dome. Uh, moving on. Oh, dome bumps. I just use carriage bolts from Menards. Um, you can, I think you can buy or you can, someone shared the plans to turn those bumps into actual buttons that do something for your R2. You know, you can run it as an input and turn something off, but mine are just um, doing nothing. Um, and then, Test fitting, test fitting greebles. Greebles is what the club members call all the pieces that stick out from the droid. You know, your holler projector, your radar eye. Just wear it, Tori. <laughs> Anything that sticks out from the droid, all those little accessories 
are called greebles, and I don't know where the name came from, but I had to test fit everything, and it looked pretty colorful and pretty. Um, on the left is all my hollow projector parts. So like what goes into having this look finished? Well, I had to glue and figure out how to put all that together. And you can see the diffusers, the, the, the white circles from my milk crates and my acrylic half domes. Here's the LEDs that are running through them. Um, and then on the right, oh, blurple. That's the color that R2 builders call this color for R2. Um, I took metallic blue and then I also took metallic purple. And um, I think I probably did it backwards. Um, I sprayed blue onto the R2 parts. And then while it was still wet, I spritzed a little of the purple on it to give it more depth. And they call that blurple for R2's color. Um, Hobby Lobby, don't have floral craft rings. So another Amazon purchase. I thought some, somebody would be making a, a holiday festive wreath with these and they would be at Hobby Lobby, but I had to go to Amazon. Um, you get two of them and it gives strength to your plastic dome because this thing's pretty flimsy without it. So um, you can see I've got little um, pinchers holding it in while I glued it in. Um, so there's R2. Um, the reason I, I made the dome first, I think I heard, I read somewhere, someone say make the dome first. So you have that win, it's a smaller part, so you feel successful. Um, I would say do that or do the opposite build the legs, the torso, and get the motors and electronics working first. Um, that, that would be the two ways I suggest you go with it. I did it totally backwards. My, I love to paint and um, work with 3D printing, so I like painted everything and, and edited everything looking pretty, and then I assembled everything. Um, here is some of the 3D printed parts that I printed here at Techno. Um, thank you, Techno, for using your 3D printers and letting me use some filament. Um, I got probably 140 pieces in this, and that's not all the pieces I 3D printed for R2. Um, aluminum skins, um, it's the same thing as the dome. There's an inner skin and an outer skin, and then you gotta break out all those panels and clean them up. Um, that's what it looks like the day it came in the mail. And um, you know, there's two front and two back. And then this is a um, video I'm proud of my son. He's four. Um, he could tap my punch to break, to break free the aluminum panels. So I had him working on R2 that day. And he was pretty happy to help. So I'm just using a wood chisel. And actually it worked out pretty good for him to tap for me. Yep. So I'm tapping all the, and what I did is I had to score with an X-Acto knife before I tapped. And that, that was the whole process. You are a loving father. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my kid, I love him so much. Like, he only messed with the parts. So I had to bring my shop in this winter. He only touched R2, the shop tools and messed with my R2 stuff once. <laughs> and it was, like, it was like two weeks ago. And I'm like, I'm so proud of him. He didn't, he was just totally, he was respectful of that's something we don't touch and mess with. Aren't all kids respectful um, not touching it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is another kit. I was looking for shortcuts. Like, okay, somebody has a kit for the wood frame, sign me up. So yeah, I threw a couple hundred bucks out for that. And I do have to tell you, I, could not I couldn't afford this robot at all. Um, I was like selling stuff at my house that I never use. Um, I spent, I took the money that I, I earned from teaching a summer class. So like, I didn't have all this money and cash laying around to build it. I had to make it work. And that was part of like the process is like finding funds for your robot parts. On the right side is the finished frame and wood glue and, and there you go. Sinna, Mike Sinna is a famous droid builder um, and he's, some of his plans have been shared with the club and then some people have done um, part runs for that. Um, I had to test fit for that and um, not everything fit right. So I, got, I, got a, I bought a wood chisel kit. Um, you'll hear in the club when you first start, if you choose to start building an astromech, there's two different kinds of blueprints. There's CSR and CSL. CSL is legacy. Um, and then CSR is like after someone in the club got permission to measure a real R2. And then everything was like, there was a couple shifts, only in a few spots. And then after that, it's a standardization. That's why there's a council for the droid building thing. Like it makes perfect sense. Like. 
it makes perfect sense. So like if I order a part, like if I, if I 3D print a file here and order an aluminum piece over here and put them together, they both fit. It's, it's brilliant. Yeah. Um, to fit your skin, I had to get these straps and make sure everything's nice and tight. Um, yeah, and that took a lot of work and I was bending it, I was denting the skin. Um, part of the reason why I weathered my R2 is because there's a whole bunch of marks in it from, from working the material. This is called the skirt and when you, R2 is flipped upside down the picture, but um, I cannot 3D print that in one piece. There's four or five, six pieces, no, eight pieces there. And then um, I've discovered Bondo, super glue to glue them together and then Bondo. And um, I love Bondo. Like, it is, like, I can take, I can take 3D prints big, you know? And so I had to sand these things and um, bond to them and smooth them some more. Here's another piece that sits on the leg that, you know, the 3D printer couldn't fit the piece on, so I had to print it in two pieces, super glue, sand it, bondo, you know, you got to prime it. Filler primer's nice. It fills some of the small holes. There's the bondo, there's the priming. And then, um... This is the piece that I that rode with me down to Kansas City, and uh, it was like 90 some degrees when I was down there. It was hot for a Maker Fair, and um, the top. There's two pieces here. The top photo, the horizontal strip at the top, you can see the wood table, and you can see the curling on both ends, um, massive curling. And this is a big chunk. It's and I, in fact, I still have it on here, and it's still slightly curled. It's right there. Um, I think I read somewhere that you put it in the oven and then bend it back. So there's my attempt. Um, I brought, I got it out of the oven and then I was like weighing it down with clamps and bricks to, to straighten it out. And I did not fix it perfectly, but it didn't look as bad as it did. Yeah, so here's probably one of the smallest pieces that were 3D printed. And um, I thought the chrome paint looks pretty nice. How did you use the chrome paint? I've always had problems with chrome paint. It, it was a bit more expensive and it said it has like a shelf life of six months once you buy it, which is but interesting. Was it super tacky, like it took forever to dry? I did like two coats. And, but I let the first coat dry for about a day. Okay. Um, but it's shiny. Like my R2 used to be really shiny, but I'll, I'll get to the part where I, I made it really dirty and roughed it up. But I like the reflection. It, it worked good. Here's a bunch of parts that I had to start um, painting with blurple and, you know, I'm masking. There's a lot of masking going on. This, this, this is why this took me 11 months. Um, and that and I have two kids and a, a wife and a full-time job. And they're, they're young kids, you know, two and four. And that, that's a good picture. I like the reflection of that centerpiece. Um, looks pretty smooth before I weathered it. These are the battery boxes. And these were multiple pieces. You can see the bondo job on the I glued them on the left, and then you can see the bondo job on the right. It's pretty cool that one, on, I think, on the top right has trans, like semi-transparent green, emerald green filament. Um, and then here's more pieces being attached to the battery boxes. It's just a huge process. Um, don't do what I did. <laughs> Most, a lot of this, don't do what I did. Um, when I 3D printed, I'm like, ah, so many pieces, let's print them fast. And so I did low, like a low resolution. So um, you can see the lines in that. And um, I thought, oh, this will just go quick. And then I, I bondle, I'd have to bondle the whole thing and sand it. Well, if I wanted just done a high resolution, I wouldn't have to bond and sand so much. But um, it all, all kind of evens out, I guess, because 140 prints in high resolution wouldn't have taken probably another extra month to print all the pieces. And How so that's... Prints did you have in the dude, and, and Tony knows, Tony 3D prints a lot. Um, I, and then, uh, just, I don't know, 50 failed prints? Like, but it's winter, you know, it's like, I know it wasn't winter, it was summer, but a lot, a lot of stuff happens with 3D printers you gotta um, work around and, and fix. Um, and then I had to, I drove out back and forth from my home or before school, I would come early or after school um, or at 10 o'clock at night, I would come out here. It was a crazy process. If I were to do it, do it again, like if the world, if everything was perfect, at least set up and I had all the money in the world, then I had, I had to have the 3D printer at home and the 3D printer at work and work would be like, cool, you can keep 3D printing while you're <laughs> teaching kids. But um, Thank you, taxpayers. <laughs> um, I'm proud of these, these foot shells. These are the foot shells because I got them priced for a, a local manufacturer to 3D print them for me in one solid piece. These are one of the pieces that are too big to print on our machine. And they quoted me as $1,000 a piece for each foot. And I didn't respond, but 
I, I printed them in several flat pieces and then they warped. And so there's tons of Bondo on them and I just worked, worked the material. Um, and then this one, I mean, look at the one on the left. There's Bondo, there's filler primer on it, there's sanding. I think that's a beautiful shot, it's all marbleized. And then once you paint them and you, and you load them up with several coats of paint, it doesn't look like, you know, it looks so bad. Um, some of my favorite tools, well, Bondo. Um, I, got, <laughs> I got better at this um, more efficient. I used to have like a hammer and a flathead screwdriver to open up the can of Bondo. And then I bought this tool that will open up the can of Bondo and also hammer the can back down. And that was like, I thought just something that made me happy. Um, this is because I didn't have to carry, carry the extra tools around everywhere. Um, and then this is another upgrade. I got a multi-max from Dremel. And this made that sanding of the, the terrible prints, the lower resolution prints that I made, so much better. I spent a lot of my time sanding in the, the low grit um, but I marked my, the, some of them looked the same, so I marked them low, medium, high on the back side so I can like switch through really quick. That's something I made up, and I'm sure I'm not the first person to think of that. Um, so that's how much Bondo one of these ankle pieces took before they got smooth, basically lines everywhere. And then we're getting to the end here. We're getting to the leg kit. Someone cut all the pieces for me. Um, legs are hard to do. There's doll rods in the kit that you can, cut off and put into the kit to, to have all the layers even stronger. Are you about hammering through your legs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's just, he's always, he always closes his eyes and smiles super big when you say cheese. There's Bondo on this, sanding, painting. You know, I got a piece of wire to hang it up. Um, there's white paint all over my garage just from floating around. Not the best way to paint. Here's a center foot that the, the kit came with the center foot the top or the center leg. So the part, the top part is part of the wood from the kit. There's tons of 3D printed parts on there. Um, and then when it came time to work on the, the aluminum frame, um, I had to glue all these pieces back on and um, I used magnets to hold them in place. Some people in the club don't paint the, the inner skin. And if I were to do this again, I would just keep the inner skin aluminum and not paint it. So you can see that shiny metal. I think that would look probably really cool. Here's something I made up for the center leg on the left. I found some bolts at Menards to hold that piece of wood in place in the bottom of the kit. And there's R2 flipped upside down, showing the center leg. And this is probably not the best way to do it, but something else I made up on how to get the center foot on a piece of wood with the, the wheels on it. Um, these are warp drives, I bought them. Somebody in the United Kingdom, I should really have his name on here, um, you know, manufactured these, you know. Well, he bought the parts, but he welded this whole box. Um, so there's a motor in it. There's Omni wheels and um, really durable. It's, these are rated for if my R2 was like the heaviest R2 you could have. And my R2 is getting heavy with the wood parts on it, the wood. <laughs> so that's why I got this, that, and I didn't want to do all this. I didn't know how, so I had a club member help me. Um, the battery box door is magnetic. I just put little magnets on it and then I glue little pieces of strips of um, metal on the inside. I don't have a, an easy way to get them off, um, but if I had like a key, I can pop, pop them off. There's nothing really inside of them except part of the motor, if you can see that in the top left corner. So you could definitely put snacks in there or something. <laughs> um, I got this piece of pipe that fits perfectly around the shoulder at Menards. And I had to ask Facebook club members, how did they do the shoulders? Um, towards the end, I asked for a lot of help to get this joy down. Some people take that reflective tape on the bottom or right and wrap them around the shoulders. Um, but I, I had to end up spray painting them because um, it was such a tight fit. I tried to sand things down and it was, just, it was hard. I was taking the grinding tools and putting them on power drills and trying to grind back the aluminum skin. And um, I was not having good luck. So those are one of my struggles. Um, this is something I made up to attach to that pricey, they call them warp drives, um, that, so I can attach this to the, the bottom of the wooden leg on the bottom of R2. So this is one of the motors on the left. That's what the left and the right foot motors look like. And it, um, I had to run wires through the leg. Luckily, 
The, the person that designed the leg kit left a, a, a hole, a cavity through the leg. So you can see there's um, all the ways. And this, I didn't know how it was going to go through the body. I had to drill a hole. That's the, the power cord that goes to the, the foot drive. And then um, this, this was funny because um, it's kind of comical, all the problems I had with this little part that I thought I was going to win easily. This is the motor that spins um, my dome, the head at the top. And you buy this adapter kit, and the CAD drawing on the right is from the company um, Pololu. Um, and I took my digital calibers and measured that um, motor rod that was sticking out and bought an adapter kit. And it ended up, some of the parts fit and some of it didn't. And so I bought another one and it worked. Um, but the problem with the scooter wheel that I bought in town, and it's a quality scooter wheel, bikes, boards, and blades, <laughs> um, great place. Um, I'm used to skate, I, I skateboard most of my, my young life, and I am not new to popping a bearing out of a urethane wheel. You just take a, a screwdriver and they, they're, they're soft, it's soft plastic or soft whatever much urethane. I thought I would do this with this, but if you look, there's metal, there's black metal around that bearing, and that's some like um, titanium, I don't know what, kryptonite. <laughs> it broke, it broke a screwdriver that I had. Oh. And then I took it to uh, Bike Sports and Blades, and they basically like bring out this little suitcase and have this crazy tool that removes bearings. Like, um, super cool. I think, um, I'm not going to say who it was, um, might have broke that tool, <laughs> getting the bearing out. But she, I already gave it away. She, she, got, she got the bearing out, and I'm so grateful for, for the help on that. But that was one little project that was a super, and then we still had problems with it at Family Fest. Once we wired it up in there, um, it's not a permanent solution, but it works. We had zip ties holding part of it together and, it, and the zip ties stretched and broke. Um, so super interesting on that one part that was a battle, but I had no idea how this worked until like three weeks ago or four weeks ago. Um, some people might wanna have a, a better plan going into this. I just learned as I went. Um, Lazy Susan, that's the metal ring. It's like, you know, those plates with the fruits that sit on them and that the whole plate spins. Um, when you buy them, you get these greasy bearings in it and it doesn't spin slow. And then you have to buy these 516s Delarine precision bearing balls. They're like little pieces of white plastic, I guess. And once you take out those greasy bearings, um, you're supposed to wipe up and kind of clean your, your um, track in there. And then you replace them with these white ones. And um, there's no motor on that. I just whipped the dome while it sits on the Lazy Susan. That thing is hauling now. So um, that's something you have to do if you want your R2 dome to move is you have to take the bearings out. And there's a, a little screw on the side of the Lazy Susan. I wish I had a picture of it, but you unscrew the screw and then you just drop all the bearings out, the metal bearings out and replace them with these pieces of white, whatever that material is. Um, ceramic, thank you. Is it like a self-lubricating thing too? I thought I read somewhere. I, I'm, I'm not sure the specifics, it's durable. Yeah, oh, appreciate it. That's, we know, I know ceramic bearings are better than metal through skateboarding. Here's just me, this, this is just like um, pure heaven here when I discovered my, my Multimax tool and me trimming with it, how cool that was. Some of this part of this video is just kind of for like, I thought that was really cool. I did buy a resin eye because this is one part. I did have 3D printed, but it was kind of, um, I had some problems with it. And so I bought a resin eye for 35 bucks and someone poured it. And then you do have to trim it a little bit, but the rest of it that you don't trim is just smooth. Okay, I'm working with resin for the first time. And uh, it's crazy, I have a breathing mask on and eye protection. And it snows when you grind to do it. So that's just something I thought, oh, cool. I've never worked with um, that kind of material before. Um, and then coming to the end, I um, weathered, did some research on weathering R2. Because if you look at a photo, if you Google R2 now, um, R2 is not white. It's in fact, R2 is way dirtier than my R2. It's almost got like a gray coating on it. Um, I took, this is the formula I found some guys on YouTube took. Acrylic paint, white, black, raw umber, and a double, I used a double shot of burnt sienna. And then I put a little bit of water and mixed all those colors up. 
I think it's probably an overkill, but um, the water, you, you want to have that as a film. And then I let it sit for four minutes, and then I wiped it off with a wet rag, but I did a, a terrible job of wiping it off because you want to create a film on the surface. And what that does is all the brown kind of gets stuck in the cracks, and that makes a nice contrast too. And you can see this is one of the foot shells that are no longer pretty white. I also tried to work it, like, um, you know, gravity, so I tried to work some of the, the streaking down from some of the parts, and then the undersides are supposed to be dirtier than the top sides, obviously, so you'll see it's way dirtier at the bottom of R2. So, so I did all these mud baths during it's probably a snowstorm. And, um, <laughs> and you have to work quick, or like sometimes the brush strokes, I used a chip brush, will, will dry fast because it's, it, you know, so you don't want to see a bunch of brushy marks all over your R2. So I, I, did, I had to do it in sections. And that was probably a really big section on the right that I usually don't do. So you'll see that's, that's a great way to make your droid look like it's um, flown around space. This is my last slide here. Um, so droid building activities for small kids. Um, my kids, have prob they've, I don't think they've ever put a screw on a bolt. So I had them do that one day. I think my daughter got it first. She's younger. Not all the way on, but it's stuck. I get that a lot. And then, you know, it's positive and negative. Let's give the kid a battery and give them some direction. And you can see, I just love his reaction in this. He kind of does a, because he was concentrating, like a, oh, I got it to work finally. And um, we'll, we'll turn the robot on here, but questions? Yes. I did not mention those because um, we just did them in the last week, and I got that's the thing I needed lots of help on. I did most really everything else my, myself, or I had someone send me parts in the mail. But um, it's a 22, 22, 22 volts. Two volts. It's a lot of power, um, and it works, but it's bigger motors. Um, I'll open it up, and you can see the electronics in it. There's sound triggers. There's Arduino. There's a um, a shield. Um, there's lots of stuff going in it, and, and I'm, thanks for Matt and John and Keith for helping me wire it up, teaching me some stuff with that, because I did not know how to do that. And I was intimidated because I didn't want the things that I bought, the electronics that I bought. I didn't want to fry experimenting because I didn't know what the hell I was doing at all. So um, yeah, we'll do a little demo if you guys don't have any more questions. What's the most expensive part you bought? Uh, the, the, the motors on the feet. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, he put the whole thing together. So it was the wheels, the base, and the motor. He's basically he welded it all, and 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 it's and he's got it. And the funny thing was, two weeks later, he comes out. And he's like, I got a new version. <laughs> <laughs> you can have a belt one, which would be quieter. But now there's a conversion kit also, so you can do belt or chain and chain and switch them out. Yeah. I'm not I'm not lying because you see everybody's name in the on, on the forum. Um. And, uh, and there's my name with the old version, and then everyone else is like super cool with the latest and newer. And like, what did I save? I saved like 150 bucks um, having the older one, and then, so I'm like, cool. I don't have to build it. I don't need to pay more money for it. What's, but What's the guesstimate on the range of the <laughs> that you spent? I, guess. I've never penciled it in. Um, I had to buy some tools. I bought some stuff I never used. Um, I, I make it easy, I say a paycheck. Uh, I'm a teacher, I get paid once a month. Um, probably, it's probably less than that though. Um, yeah, it probably cost me a few thousand bucks. I mean, if this is 175 bucks and the skin's 200 bucks and the lights are 200 bucks, I mean, you're quickly adding up to a thousand bucks really fast. So probably 3,000 is, um, was it, it was totally worth it. I mean, 11 months and, and and now I get to share it, and it, it, was, it was totally worth it. Is that in materials, or is that the tools that you have purchased? I mean, tools weren't so bad. I mean, I just bought a Dremel. But then I, I bought all the attachments. Like, I need a, <laughs> I need a, oh, I need carving. Oh, they have a carving set. And I actually use the carving set a lot. 
and I'm like, oh, I need to cut through a pipe. I don't have anything that cuts through a pipe. So I bought the, the metal cutting set. Yeah, I got a little addicted to Dremel accessories. I, and, and, the, and the Multimax were the, the two expensive tools that I bought. Um, but you can do, do this whole build with sm the smaller tools, you know, like power drill and um, things that I had like jigsaw and um, you, don't ha you don't need big tools to build, build R2. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, so here's the underside. I don't have this connected to the electronics downstairs, but this is the TESIS kit. And uh, the drone builder in Kansas City put Velcro um, tape on his battery pack to keep it in there. I'm like, oh, I'll steal that. He also used silicone and to keep all his pieces in. And then if you wanted to upgrade it, it's easy to rip out the silicone pieces. So that's how some of these parts, it's either Gorilla Super Glue or silicone. Um, this part's a little nerving. Um, X, the controller, it's Xbox 360. Somebody wrote code for a, a PlayStation 2 controller, and then those kind of were hard to find. So they updated the code, and um, it's called Padawan 360, and the code's on GitHub. So um, you buy the controller, and then you have to buy an Xbox wireless receiver and plug it into a host shield on the Arduino. So um, this is really, it looks really cool, but John and I found out at Stimfest, it's fun to hide the controller. Um, there's other people, there's another version um, called Shadow something, where it's like wee nunchucks, but they're um, wireless and you can hide them in your pocket or like your coat jacket pocket. And that might be a, a cool upgrade um, battery. I've never, funny thing is I've never even plugged it in myself yet. I always, I've always had these guys around me the last week or so. And if you would like to come up and look down, how about I'll drive it out in the middle and then later on you can come out, out up and look down and see what's on there. All the electronics are drilled onto a cutting board that I bought from Walmart. So they all, and they just slide it in and out a plastic cutting board. Um, I don't need my phone. Let me see if I'm connected before I put the dome on. Oh yeah. Um, these guys, I have a Bluetooth speaker in here, but um, John's like, <laughs> Why, why don't we wire the power into it so I don't have to charge it? Because it's a wireless speaker. Unless it was already on. Oh, I didn't slide the power thing on all the way. Yeah, funny stuff there. So I'm connected, it already connected already, already way. Oops, start. So um, I can control like 55 sounds in a sound library that I put on a little card. And it plays some of them random. Um, and then you learn the, the co button combos, like this button plus L1 does a different sound. So there's this whole library you gotta learn. Um, I kind of forget that there's a wolf whistle one. There's a scream that's funny too. I kind of have to learn them again. Left one plus bottom. Left one plus bottom. John was funny, like, we were at Family Fest, he's like, can I just control it? And I'm like, yes, because he helped me get across the finish line. So I think, a little better, for five hours, he was like, ran, the, ran R2, which was really, really great. Um, and then, um, that's a dome spin. It's probably a little faster than it needs to be. Everything is when it comes to motors. Um, kind of scary fast. So um, the controller's touchy. I just push on it a little bit, or R2 will do like burnouts. And um, <laughs> you can buy magnetic dome kits that you can magnetically click your dome on. Another upgrade I didn't want to spend money on. Better move out. I'm still learning how to drive it.
And this is speed one. I'm, I'm not even going all the way up to the edge of the controller. You can change it to sp um, setting two and then setting three. It's R2 screams to warn you that you're in fast mode. Um, it's coded for that. That's, that's my R2 presentation. Um, you know, feel free to ask me more questions and I'll take the dome off and you can come take a look at it. Um, it does need some more tweaking, but um, I'll add some more upgrades to it in the future too. Um, there we go. Thanks, Tori. Thank you. Thank you for coming.